I want to begin a brand new three-week series on the theme of faith. My topic today is bold steps to faith. Every one of us is on a faith journey. Every one of us oftentimes experiences a gap in our lives from where we are to where we want to be. Think about it this way. Picture a mountain and you standing on that mountaintop, but yet you want to get to the other mountain, the other mountain, the preferred side, the better side, the side that has the answers to your current predicament. But there's this gulf, this gap, this chasm between where you are and where you want to be. The bridge that you'll need to cross over to get to the other side is a bridge titled faith. And faith is what you're going to have to engage and exercise in order to get where God wants you to be. I love what A.W. Tozer, noted American pastor and author, once said. Faith is a decision we make to act in a way that honors God, trusting Him, even when the evidence is unclear. So faith is having confidence in God. It's exercising a bold trust in God. And God rewards those who use faith. In fact, he tells us it's impossible to please him unless we use faith. I want to spend our time looking at the gospel of Mark. But keep in mind, faith is not, some, is not simple-mindedness. Faith is, think about it this way, faith is an asset. Faith is the finishing touches on your intellect. Just like emotional intelligence is an asset and the finishing touches on analytical intelligence. I love being around smart people that are very analytically intelligent. But when they are very weak in emotional intelligence, I don't want to be around them. Because they say things that are hurtful and they're caustic. But what a good compliment if they who are very analytically intelligent also a very good and strong with emotional intelligence. Man, what a winning combination. Same way if you are someone that's very, very, you are someone very smart analytically, but you don't use faith. You're missing out on something that complements who you are. Faith and being analytically strong, they're not opposite to one another. They should be working together in harmony like a left foot and a right foot walking together. I want us to spend our time seeing how Jesus helps us make bold steps of faith. Let's look at Mark chapter 2 and verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier? To say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. Stop there. Man, I wish I was there. I wish you were there. Let's go there to Capernaum. Let's put ourselves in the story. You may say, where, where, where do you want us to be? I want us to stand right by the opening of the door to the house. It's already filled with people that came before us. So we got to stay right there at the, 
at the door. Let's lean in and listen. Scripture says Jesus was preaching the word. There are different Greek words for the English word preaching. I reference Greek because the New Testament was written in Greek, in Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-E, classical Greek. This word for preach, it has the meaning, the flavor, like it was conversational preaching. But the way Jesus preached, it was so beautiful, scholars are saying, the birds weren't even chirping. And the people that were so empty, emotionally and spiritually, they just felt like they were being given a cup of water to a thirsty sojourner. That's how Jesus was preaching. Come on, let's keep standing by the door. Let's listen. Capernaum was the headquarters to the major part of Jesus' public ministry. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9 and verse 1, the language is Capernaum was Jesus' own town. In Mark chapter 2, in this passage, it was referred to as he has come home. In fact, three of Jesus' 12 disciples lived in Capernaum, Peter and his brother Andrew. They had moved from Bethsaida, according to John 1, verse 44, and they relocated to Mark, oh, I'm sorry, relocated to Capernaum. Here we see it in, in Mark 1, verse 29. That's where they lived. The third disciple that lived in Capernaum was, was Matthew, the tax collector. His office where he collected taxes from and his home were in Capernaum. So Capernaum was a very familiar place that Jesus went and came and, and he hung out there. But he's preaching now. He'd come back home and he's preaching. Something was going on in the life of a paralyzed man when he heard that Jesus had come home and the town had gathered to this house to hear Jesus preach as he's holding this meeting. But what we'll learn from this, because this story is about faith, that there are three bold steps that we must take when we use faith. The first is knowledge. The second step is believe. And the third and final step is action. You might have some things in your life or areas of your life that's paralyzed. I don't know, maybe your, your, your family life, your relationship with one of your children or with maybe several of your children. It's just, man, it's not healthy. It's in this place of paralysis. And you're longing and hoping, God, can you bring life to this which seems like it's just not working? Maybe it's your career. You're hitting the ceiling. And you've been there at the ceiling so long, you're just like, I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe it's your finances that seems like, man, it's just, I make money, I spend money, I lose money. I, it's just one bad thing after another. Uh, it, it's, it's paralyzed. I want us to believe God together as I walk you through these three bold steps to faith that God can heal the paralysis of that part of your life like he did this paralyzed man. Let's look at the first step. Knowledge is the first step to faith. The Bible teaches that faith is your key to unlocking God's promises and God's provision. But a person cannot apply faith in that which they don't know. You can't say, I have faith, or I'm going to apply faith, and someone asks you, do you know? Yeah, I don't know. Having knowledge means you know something to be true and reliable. You have some information. See, faith is not blind. Faith is not, it's, it's not ignorance. It's not nonsensical. It's, faith is reasoned. The French theologian and pastor John Calvin said, Faith rests not on ignorance, but on knowledge. And this is not only true of the faith by which men are first led to Christ, but of the faith by which they remain in Him. It's not blind faith. There's no such thing as blind faith. The irreligious says, say that because they don't know any better. Faith is, the first step towards faith is knowledge. 
I remember following a Sunday service many years ago. This woman made a beeline to me and she said, Pastor, and she spoke in a very hurried way. Pastor, you can see she's passionate about something. Pastor, would you pray with me? And I said, what's the, what, what's the need? What's the topic? She said, I want to start my own car wash business. I just feel this entrepreneurial endeavor. I need to start my own car wash business. Would you pray with me? And before I prayed, I said, how much does it cost? She said, I have no idea. I said, I want you to take this next week, do some research, find out the cost. Next week, I, I said, I'll pray with you next week. Next week came. I saw her sitting there in the seat. She didn't come up to me. So I went to her after the service. And I said, I'm ready to pray with you now about your car wash business. I said, what's the price? She said, Pastor, I looked it up. It's very expensive. Forget about praying. You don't need to pray with me. <laughs> See, and I'm not suggesting that the expense of the car wash business should have frightened her. All I wanted her to know was that it requires knowledge to exercise faith. And she had no idea what she was believing God for if she, in fact, was going to believe God for it. And so the same thing I say to you, that if you're going to take bold steps to exercise your faith, it starts off with knowledge. That's the first step. And so this man, who is now paralyzed, he had to have knowledge that not only was God a healer, but that there was some reliability that indeed God could heal him. And Jesus was sympathetic and is sympathetic towards his condition. So when I do a little trace through scripture to see what kind of healings or if any came or occurred in the city of Capernaum, indeed there were many. In Matthew chapter 8 verse 5 through 13, we learn that there was a paralyzed centurion or paralyzed servant of a centurion. A centurion is a captain over a hundred soldiers. Jesus, at some earlier time, having gone back home to Capernaum, healed the paralyzed servant. It became noise abroad. I mean, if somebody in your community experiences a healing, a breakthrough, something transformative, and you're in small communities like Capernaum, man, everybody's going to know. Earlier in Mark chapter 1, at another time when Jesus had come home to Capernaum, verse 21 tells us, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Now, between verse 21 and verse 25, this commotion occurred. There was a demonized man in the sanctuary, and the demons in the man started to speak. I want us to join them at this point at verse 25. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him, speaking to the demon and the man. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. That's a healing. People knew. In Capernaum, they knew. They had knowledge that not only did Jesus heal the paralyzed guy who was a servant of a centurion, he healed this demonized man. But that wasn't it. There was more public knowledge of Jesus' healing. Because in that same moment after Jesus left the synagogue, verse 29 tells us something else. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. So here we see yet another instance. And when you read verses 31 to 34 of Mark 1, it tells us that that evening, many people in the town gathered the outside of the home of, of Simon and, 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 and Andrew. And Jesus, Scripture says, Jesus healed many and set many free that were oppressed with demons. In other words, it was public knowledge Jesus was a healer. I want you to recognize that the first step of you having faith is to take a step of knowledge. I know that God can do this for me. He's done it for others. And since he's no respecter of persons, the same God that did it for them can do it for me. 
Come on, let's applaud the Lord. Paul, I got to bring Paul into the conversation because he spoke to this. In Romans 10 verse 17, Paul says, So the faith comes from a report hearing. And the report hearing through a word about Christ. In other words, you gain faith because you heard what God did for someone else. Yesterday I spoke at this men's conference. And during the break time, you know, they had some of the ladies in the church who were assisting so that the men can just focus strictly on the conference and get everything that they needed to get for their, themselves in their home. This lady, she came up to me. She said, Pastor, your, your wife ministered at our church about 15 years ago. And after she preached, she invited, because it was a women's conference, she invited some of our ladies, those, those ladies to come to the front to be prayed for if they longed to have children and they, weren't unable, they were unable to. She said, man, I, I've been married for a number of years and my husband and I were trying and we just were unsuccessful. So I ran up to the front and she prayed over me. And then she said, do you see this little boy sitting down in his chair right now? I said, yeah, I see him. She pointed to the little boy. He was 11 years old. She said, he's 11 years old. He's coming. He came here today. This is my son. This is the answer of your wife's prayer. And so when I heard that, this is what the scripture is teaching us in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from report hearing. See, when you have knowledge of what God has done, it just lifts you. And you say, if God did it for them, guess what? He can do it for me. And so that paralyzed man sitting there in his home heard that Jesus is back home in Capernaum and he's holding a meeting. I mean, you can see, man, knowledge. Martin Luther, the great German theologian said, the more knowledge, the more faith. The more you know, the more you will believe. And so I want you to see that how it's so crucial for you to get some knowledge. How do you, how, why, why are you thinking that God can't do it for you? Oh, it's hard. Who told you that God doesn't live in the place that's hard? You need to know that when you're in God country, you might say, what's God country? Where is that? God country is when you have a big need and you don't know what to do. God country is when you have a big financial need and you don't have the money. God country is when you have a big need in your body and you can't be, get healed. God country is when you have all these gifts that have no expression. God country is when you're single and you want to get married and you don't have someone that is marriageable in your life and you don't know where, when, how, and that's God country. God country is where God is. God country is when God steps into your circumstances stands and he is a bridge to help you get to your blessing and experience your promises some of you you're in God country knowledge is the first step to faith and Martin Luther he made it clear he says the more you know the more you will believe and that leads to the very next step to faith and that is believe that's the second step to faith see knowledge by itself is not faith Knowledge could be very passive. Yeah, I know God can do it, but it's not happening. But when you believe, it means you accept and agree with what you know. When you believe, you move from being passive to being active. When you believe, you have a conviction. When you believe, you reveal your faith position. See, by believing, it means that I know that God can do it, and he can do it for me, and I'm going to move towards it. So faith is you take one step, you know. It's still not faith. I believe. St. Augustine, who's a North African theologian and philosopher, said, faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. So I want you to see that you got to believe. To believe is to have confidence. To believe is to have assurance in God's ability and his willingness. I must bring into the conversation what the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for 
and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. What does the Bible mean when it says the ancients? The old timers. Moses, Abraham, Sarah, Elijah, Matthew, Mark, Deborah. These are the ancients. And sometimes when we read scripture and we see what these men and women of God accomplished, and we think that they were superhuman people, that, oh, they're different. Scripture tells us in the book of James that Elijah was an ordinary guy, just like you and me. Ordinary guy. So in other words, don't remove yourself from the faith equation thinking that you're not some super saint. None of us are. That's why the scripture says that they, referencing the ancients of old, were commended before God and that God was pleased with them. God bragged about them. Why? Because they had confidence in him. They had assurance in his ability. And that's what faith is. Now, what does it mean when you're, when you're going to that next step of believing, belief? You believe in God. It takes reflection to get to that place of deep conviction. You ask yourself tough questions. Why am I in this condition? What must I do to get out of this? This man is he's, he's laying on a mat at home, paralyzed. Jesus is holding a meeting. The town is going out to see his meeting. And he's saying, well, look, I heard that Jesus is a healer. You can imagine he may have looked down on, at his feet while he's laying there. saying, why can't he heal my immobile feet, my feet that's lost its ability to move and have strength? And then he believes. He said, you know, I, I'm going to seek, seek God for healing. I hear that Jesus cares. This paralyzed man wrestled with ideas while he's laying on that mat. Questions, difficult questions, such as, you know, if God wants it to happen, it will happen. Now, some people think that way. And they fall into a trap saying, you know, if, if it was meant to be, it'll be. But that man wrestled with that, and he pinned those questions to the mat, realizing that's not, that's not good theology. In fact, that kind of reasoning, there's a $10 theological word I must attach to it. It's called antinomianism. Say that five times, I'll give you $10. Antinomianism is the doctrinal notion that because of our salvation relationship with Christ, there's nothing else we must do. We have no responsibility to act. We have no responsibility to believe, to lean in. Well, that type of notion and theological view, it's very destructive and detrimental. It is a false theological proposition because it means that if God wants me healed, he'll heal me right here my, on my mat in my house. I don't need to go anywhere. That man didn't fall into that trap. He didn't fall prey, P-R-E-Y, to that kind of thinking. He recognized that I have knowledge that Christ is a healer and I believe that Christ can heal me. And so he realized, hey, this is right here in Capernaum, in my own backyard. He did have a problem, though. How am I going to get up and go? And so knowledge, that's the first step to faith. Believe, the second step to faith. I take you to the third and final step that leads to faith. It's called action. While knowledge and belief are bold steps, they by themselves don't constitute faith. You need this third ingredient, action. Action, which is deliberate, intentional, and specific. To experience God's miracles, you must apply faith. You must take action. James 2 verse 17 says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So James is telling us, you got to act. You have to be able to recognize the need to act. It's, it's up to you. you gotta, you got to act on this. There's this little boy, 10 years old. He's home by himself, first time. He's trying to cook, shouldn't be. Left the pot on the stove, a fire starts in the kitchen. He runs into the bedroom. Smoke is following him. The fire starts to burn through the apartment. He runs into his bedroom. He closes the door. He's freaking out. He goes to his bedroom window that opens over the street opens it wide, and he yells out, help, help, there's a fire in my house, I'm going to die. 
All of a sudden, this big, burly man, 6'4", 250 pounds, big arms, 23 inches, biceps, stands below. He's in the third floor, and he stands below it, and he yells up at the boy, Son, jump, I'll catch you. And he holds out his arms like this, and he's so convincing. Jump, son, jump, I'll catch you. The little boy has knowledge that the big burly man asserts that he can catch him. Still not faith. He starts running around the room again. He's panicking even more. And then he gets close to the window again. And he says, help me, help me. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I don't want to die. And the man, he stands there flat-footed. And he's, as he's holding his arms out, showing how he's going to catch the boy. His biceps are just bulging. And he says, come on, son. Come on, you don't have much time. Jump. I'll catch you. And the boy looks into the face of the big man. And he's so serious. And he's so authentic. And he's so sincere. The boy believes the big man but it's still not faith. And all of a sudden, a fire starts scorching the door, and the boy is really panicking. He runs over to the window a third time, says, I don't have much time. I don't have much time. Please help me. And the, big, the man says, come on, son. You don't have much time. Jump. Jump. Trust me. Trust me. I'll catch you. And the little boy opens the window all the way, and he climbs out on the ledge, and he jumps. He takes action, and the big man catches him. That's faith. Knowledge, believe, action. That's faith. I love what Thomas Aquinas tells us. Faith is the soul of action. Without faith, action becomes weak and timid. But with faith, it becomes powerful and strong. I want you to see how he's bringing it home. Now, I left you standing at the door. And Jesus is preaching the word. You always need to have friends that have crazy faith to help you when you may not be able to get everything done by yourself. I don't know about you, but I need people like that in my life. When I have big problems, big needs, and when I need to go before God, I don't want people that are timid, that are shy, that are scared, that I don't know, and they start putting doubt in your mind and fear. What happens if God doesn't show up? I don't want to be around those people. They act like they're smart because they can tell you all the reasons why God can't do it. I got to try to dismiss myself from people like that because they, can't, they don't have any faith. And they'll say, I'm here for you. How are you here for me? You're not helping me. You're riddling my faith with all this doubt and rationalization. I need some people that can, that can pick me up in my house when I'm paralyzed and bring me to Jesus. And so let's take to the text. Mark 2 verse 3. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. And we learned, as we read earlier, the man gets healed. But we're still standing at a door. And the language of Scripture is that some men came means there were more than four. And they had to walk through town carrying. They may have alternated each man taking a post, taking one of the areas of the, the, the wooden stave that's holding the mat, and they're carrying it through town. I can hear the naysayers. Where are you guys going? Someone yell out, we're going to the crusade. Uh, our friend, God, God's going to heal him today. They yell out, don't waste your time. I went. The place is so crowded, you can't even get in. You can't even hear Jesus. Don't waste your time. Save your trip. Go back home. But they weren't deterred. You need friends like that. As they kept on walking, carrying the guy, someone else may have yelled, Hey, where are you guys going? We're going to the crusade. Man, that prayer line is so long. I don't even know how Jesus would get a chance to pray for your friend. Don't even waste your time. Get all frustrated and tired and angry. Just go back home. They ignored him. Went there. Now, when the Bible says some men came bringing to him, in the Greek language, it has the flavor. That means it was a commotion going on as they were coming. So people are looking back. What's going on? What's going on? When they get there, the place is thronged with people. The doorway jam-packed. You're there. I'm there. We're blocking the door. What are these guys doing? And all of a sudden, it's amazing. When you have faith, there's creativity and ingenuity. 
These guys, they decided, let's go up to the roof. Now, in Bible days, the roof was flat, and it was like your veranda, like your backyard, in terms of a deck, a patio. And so there's a staircase outside of the house that went up the side of the, the house into to the roof. These guys, they said, let's go up to the roof. Now, you know when you're carrying something, particularly someone on a mat, when you're going up the stairs that's inclined, those who are on the lower part has to raise it up so the man stays flat. Those on the upper end have to lower it so the pallet's flat, so the mat's flat, and so there has to be an anti-coordination. Each step at a time, you're lowering it or you're raising it, and then they get up to the roof, and the roof in Bible days was made out of a composite of materials. It was made out of gravel, There were tile slats, as Luke 5, having the same story, points out tile slats across the joists. There was mud, a thatched roof, and sometimes grass growing the crevices. Now, they're going to dig up the roof. How do you, you don't leave your house saying, we're going to go to, uh, to someone's house, we're going to dig up the guy's roof, so let's bring tools. You don't bring any tools with you. You're going to a crusade. It's like you didn't bring tools with you to the service today. You're not going to dig up the roof. If you do, I'm going to call the police. But you're not going to, you, 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 the idea, you're not going to dig up the roof. You don't come prepared with tools. And so they had to be inventive and ingenious. Someone had to say, let's get some sticks. Hey, let's get a big rock. Let's get some stones. And, and you need rope. You don't leave your house saying, I'm going to lower my friend through the roof and I'm going to lower it with rope. You got to look in neighbor's backyards and you may find twigs and vines and you, you, find, you, know, you, you find rope and you say, hey, let's tie it to each end of the pallet. Now, you got to know where to dig. You can't dig four holes. So first you got to put the man's man, the, pat, the mat down with the man on it. Now, the, the average height of a man in Bible days, first century, it was five foot five. And that's based on archaeological digs and the measurement of someone's, of someone's skeletal, particularly in the Roman Empire, was five foot five or 165 centimeters. Now, I'm five seven, so I would have been tall back then. See, my issue, my issue, I'm not short. I was just born in the wrong century. That's all. Not short, not short, not short. And the width of a man that's five foot five is typically 16 inches in terms of the shoulder, which is 41 centimeters. Now, if you're going to put an opening in a person's roof of that dimension, you don't just dig two or three holes to figure it out because it's not your house. You know, you, there's going to be a major problem. You can't do that. So you got to lay the pallet down and find out. So someone's walking on the roof and saying, okay, where's Jesus preaching? Because I'm going to put it down right there in front of him where he can't miss us. Guys, is, is he over there? No, 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 no. The voice is coming from over here. He's, he's over here, guys. Let's dig here. So while the four guys are digging, I want you to sneak up now on the side of the, the, the staircase and look over and see what they're doing. They're digging this hole. and got to dig a hole. It has to be longer than five foot five, longer than 165 centimeters and wider than 16 inches to lower the pallet. And you got to put, you have to tie each end with rope. So you're in that house, Jesus preaching. Remember now, the scholars say it was so mesmerizing. And the birds stopped chirping because you were hearing a gospel of hope and love and forgiveness and God's redemption. And as Jesus preaching, all of a sudden, you start seeing some dust just falling down. Can you imagine the homeowners as they're seeing dust come down in their house? And you have a guest there. This is the dignified. This is the son of God. And you're hosting him. You know how it is, parents, when you have a, a very famous person coming to your house or someone that you, you honor, and then you and your kids have silent languages you use when you want them to check something out. And so you may have looked over, you see dust come, you see this little light just shining. You didn't have a skylight in your roof, this little sun, ray of sun shining through. You may have just looked at a kid, go, go. I mean, you know how it is. I grew up in the 70s when you have TVs and you have antennas and, and they didn't have remote control back then. I was the remote control. So when my parents are watching TV and something goes wrong with the TV or they want to change the channel and they don't like what's going on, they didn't even say anything. They just look at me and you, and you knew. Go up, get up there, turn the channel, fix the antennas. And so they have language that they use. And so you can imagine these guys, Jesus preaching and all of a sudden there's this hole. The homeowner's probably so incensed. I don't have a skylight. And then the hole gets bigger. 
clumps of, de- of, of, of dirt and mud and a thatch of clay falls down. Then they're lowering this guy. Now, to lower someone on the mat, you got to have hand-to-eye coordination so you don't tilt him over. And now he's messed up more than paralyzed leg. Broken arm, broken ribs, broken neck. So you got to have this hand-to-eye coordination. And so they're doing that. And Jesus preaching. And the scripture says he saw their faith. Why? When that mat landed and Jesus looking up, those four guys, they're putting their over there, their necks are over that hole, looking down, seeing what's going to happen. And Jesus, scripture says, he saw their faith. They had knowledge that he was a healer. They believed he was a healer. They took action that he would heal. And that's faith. I want you to see what God can do. This is the God that we serve. And then you have the religious people. They can't understand God's big heart. And Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven you. The scholars agree that what caused him to be, to, you know, to experience the paralysis was something that was attributed to his sinful life and behavior. It caught up with him. And Jesus spoke right to the root causes. I want you to know that even if your own short-sightedness, your own moral faux pas, your own sinful behavior got you in the pickle that you're in, our God is so loving, so kind, so forgiving, so redemptive, so restorative, that he's willing to forgive you of your sins and so that you'll be healed of that area of your life that's paralyzed. That's the God that we serve. That's why I love him so. That's why I serve him with this reckless abandon. That's why I left atheism to become a follower of Jesus because he has a big heart for all the broken, all those who are empty, all those who are disillusioned, all those who are searching. And that's why this paralyzed man had some of his four crazy friends take him through town Tear, tear up someone's roof, lower him down in the roof, and Jesus healed him of his sin and healed him of his paralysis. Come on, someone magnify our God. That's the God who we serve. That's who we walk with. That's why we love him so. Because he is so, so powerful. And then Jesus says, Son, which the Greek word means an adult son. It's a term of endearment. Son, pick up your bed, pick up your mat, and go home. Man got up, power came in his legs, grabbed his mat, just started walking out. It's amazing. The very place that you couldn't get in, you can get out. When you are the miracle, God always creates a way for you. Always does. And that's what he wants. And I want to pray with you today because that area of your life that's paralyzed, why can't Jesus heal it?